we're going to move right along now to uh, Marty's discussion on the passive house up in Fort St. John. Well, thank you very much, Ellen, and all the green building leaders for having me I'll be able to talk about the passive house project, which we're pretty excited about. But I'll have to correct Ellen right at the start here and drop the bad news that unfortunately we're actually not finished the project. We're probably a couple months out still, so we're doing some work internally um, on the passive house. And winter is not helping with the process, and we don't have a very good general contractor who actually is myself and our one building inspector. So that's just an interesting fact that we weren't successful in retaining a general contractor for the project. So city staff are actually acting as somewhat of a general contractor managing subtrade. So that's been fun, learning lots, but definitely is going to make the process go a lot slower. So I won't get into the, the background legislation framework of why we're doing these things. Uh, we're in a similar situation most of the municipalities in BC with having community energy targets, uh, greenhouse gas targets, as well as our own corporate targets. But we're trying to take conservation very serious in Fort St. John, being such a generation-driven community, extraction, oil and gas. Uh, we want to really make a mark on conservation and the fact that we're a northern uh, climate community kind of amplifies that point to to, to show that if it can be done done up here, then um, should be quite uh, possible elsewhere as well. So there's a picture of the the pots falls before the snow came. So in the fall, and you can see the exterior is getting pretty close to be finished. Just uh, some of the trim around the windows, etc. You can see the photovoltaic panels. Um, so that gives you an idea of the the unique shape of the building. So I'll first drop a little bit of information on what a pass post is. Some people might not have an idea, so I'll drop the the specs first off, which are gonna, might be foreign to some of you. Um, so it's a voluntary standard that, that came out of, of Germany. So it's not anything you have to do, but it's definitely one of the most stringent energy efficiency standards in the world. So it requires a heating load of less than or equal to 10 watts per meter squared, uh, heating energy demand of less than 15 kilowatt hours per meter squared per year, uh, it ha has a primary energy requirement as well, so you don't put in uh, crappy appliances and things like that after the fact, so they do look at that. Um, they want to minimize thermal bridging in the, the building to as low a level as possible, so no weak spots in your, your envelope where cold can essentially bridge, bridge through. It's extremely airtight, so less than 0 0.6 air changes at 50 pascals, and just for reference, a uh, home kind of built in the 2000, 2000s would be around three to four air changes per hour. So it's very, very airtight. Uh, only super efficient windows can uh, be part of the passive house package, so they don't allow windows to be a weak point for thermal comfort reasons and condensation and things like that. And mechanical ventilation with heat recovery has to be included because the, the building's so airtight. So you need to be controlling ventilation mechanically. And there is a minimum efficiency requirement on the equipment or you get penalized uh, in the modeling. And you also want to orientate the building to maximize solar gains. So like I said, that's kind of the engineering specs. Uh, what does that mean when you really build a building? So a ridiculously thick wall with a lot of insulation. Of course, that can be minimized depending on the type of insulation you use. So this is a quick shot of our kind of wall ceiling or roof detail. And you can see the roof panel is 16 inches. And we're actually putting another 2 by 4 framed wall on the inside of that. So effectively, it's like a 20-inch wall. Really awesome windows. Triple panes, usually the minimum. A lot of them are double low emissivity coating and exceptionally thermal broken frame. So you don't get any thermal bridging through the frame. You know, most people are probably familiar with aluminum buildings, uh, window frames in commercial buildings where you can essentially feel outside temperature when you touch that frame. So eliminating it in that. Uh, here's a isothermic view of the foundation detail just showing that there's no thermal uh, bridging through where the foundation, the wall, the floor, etc. meets. So you can see the, the different temperature gradients based on the different colors. And here's another shot just uh, depicting the lack of thermal bridging in the, the good envelope. So a conventional building and then a passive house building. And the blue and the, the light green shades are, are saying that there's less heat loss and can, compared to Canadian housing, uh, it's typically 90% less energy for heating and cooling uh, relative to kind of like a code built, or in this case, a new 2010 building. 
and that equates to about a 60% reduction in, in total energy. And I know we've been talking Energuide numbers and that a lot, so I just wanted to throw this slide up so people can relate to passive house kind of from an Energuide perspective. So you can see at the very top of the, the graph, the passive house on the Energuide rating scale usually comes in around Energuide 88 or higher. So just for reference. And another way to look at uh, those passive house metrics is low operating cost for the building. So a low is $100 a year for heating and cooling. Exceptional comfort, comfort, so typically no cold spots, no drafty areas by windows. You're not going to get condensation or mold issues because the house is at one very uh, consistent temperature throughout. Continuous fresh air because you're using high efficiency heat recovery to always be bringing air in and reclaiming some of the the energy that's in the exhaust air as it, it goes back outside. You have design freedom. Uh, the pots of house standards is actually performance based. So as long as you hit those numbers, you can make it look any way you want or do whatever you want it to. So it is not in any way prescriptive. Uh, another way to look at the cost, um, if you amortize the construction premium, which does typically come in at around 10 to 15 percent higher than a normal build. It could be a little bit higher in, in Canada still. But if you amortize that premium on, on the construction cost over the lifetime of your mortgage, what you save on your utility bills by building such an efficient building actually exceed that uh, premium on your mortgage payment. So from day zero, you, you could be saving saving money already. And you could consider it a true net zero energy ready building. It's at such a high efficiency level that it makes renewable energy technologies very cost effective to be added uh, today or at a later date when they reduce further in price. So I like to think of it as additional value, not cost. So people like to talk about additional cost you're adding to projects, but everything that you've paid for is true value that you've added to, to a building. And the city's uh, framing it in a, as a net zero cost upon sale. So we're tying up of course, some tax money to demonstrate this project, but upon resale, we're essentially recouping the cost. So it's a net zero cost over over the uh, project life. Standard features of the home: three bedroom, one office, or flex room. So it could be a four bedroom if you wanted it. It has two full bathrooms and another half bath. There's an upstairs living space, a downstairs living space. It's around 2,000 square feet, and it's on a 0.16 acre lot. Uh, the building, some of the green features or premium features is that the building is made from prefabricated panels that were pre-insulated with siding and everything already on them when they arrived on site. And essentially the main building envelope was at close up in three, four days. The guy, I think the guys are in town about a week and then we had to uh, do the roofing and, and all the other finishing work and interior stuff after the fact. Um, there's a heat recovery ventilator. This one has no electric defrost, which is unique. Um, the home is also made to be universally accessible, so there's some provisions incorporating some of the standards from the Safer Home Standard around zero-step entrances. We've done different things with plug heights, added plugs for for future uh, chair lifts to upstairs if people have wheelchair need wheelchair assistance. There's reinforcements for hand grab rails in washrooms. There's uh, GFI plugs in the bathrooms, things like that. Uh, I already mentioned the the consumption, so expecting to be about night percent less for heating and cooling energy. So the walls are R56. That's the effect of R value. The floor is R52 and the ceilings are 70. If you look at it from a greenhouse gas perspective, the house is 100% electric as well. So it's, it's pretty much a 99% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions compared to a typical home that would be built with the natural gas furnace in, in our community. Um, as I mentioned, it's net zero energy ready. Air conditioning and heating are provided by air source heat pump technology. We also have heat mats in the house as kind of a backup because the heat pumps go down to close to minus 30 and then they will cut out. So we have that as well as it helps with some of the zoning control with temperature in the home. Uh, we have metal roofing, which is unique for Fort St. John, might not be for, for some of the other places and the siding is uh, treated cedar. And the photovoltaic system on the roof is 2.82 kilowatt, and that'll cover almost 30% of the total energy requirements of the house. And we pre-wired the whole southern portion of of the roof where the photovoltaic panels aren't 
currently installed for future provisions. If somebody wants to add the extra PV panels to actually make it a net zero energy building. And yeah, high efficiency tail turn windows with, that have aluminum exterior cladding and a wood, I think it's Douglas fir interior. I just wanted to show this uh, slide quickly. So from our energy modeling, um, this is how the losses from the building kind of uh, panned out. So you can see the windows and the walls are still where most of the, the heat loss is happening from. And on the right side, you can see the, the gains or the energy required to essentially net out those losses in the building. So the unique thing about a passive house, if you get the solar orientation correctly and, and choose appropriate windows, is you can see solar gains alone can, can cover up to 70% of the required energy to actually heat the house. And then I think you get another 10% uh, or so from internal gains, so just people being in the building and appliances on and, and lights on. And we only need that little yellow top piece uh, in terms of auxiliary heating or from your actual heating system. So in a typical house, your solar gains might only cover 3 to 10% with a good orientation, but in passive house with such a small heat and cooling demand, well not necessarily cooling, um, that portion becomes extremely significant. So take the free energy if you can get it. A little bit of a plug here on our project, I apologize for that. So September 4th we, we got pre-certification which basically says uh, pending our blower door test, uh, the project's essentially certified. So we just have to do that to verify the, the air tightness level but they've already verified that we've done what we said to do regarding the design and the modeling and we've done some sh shading analysis on site to make sure uh, we're factoring the appropriate solar gains into that model. So we're expecting it to be the most northern passive house, certified passive house in Canada and the first single family detached certified project in BC. And an interesting thing, uh, the, the one fellow I'm working with on the project on uh, architectural and does lead project as well, Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. Uh, he's been keeping track of, of the scoring system throughout this project and if we decided to do dual certification, the project would actually come in at LEED Platinum as well. Um, as a rule of thumb, passive house, typically you're a shoe in for LEED Gold provided you meet prerequisites, but it, it hits so many of the points on the, the energy requirements that you're, you're already doing doing great towards something like Lee Gold or Lee Platinum. And replication, so I didn't talk about cost, but we know for a fact that if we did it again, we can do it for at least 20 to 30 percent less, just, just from what we've learned doing this project. And we're looking at around $280 square foot, finished square footage as a cost to the homeowner, because this, this is an owner builder project. We're not seeing like contractor costs. And that might seem high, but Fort St. John housing is actually getting very expensive. And a lot of the comparable new buildings in Fort St. John, you're looking at 300 to 380 um, dollars per finished square foot. So we're we're well on target to be in the same ballpark as other new new builds in Fort St. John. And with that, a couple more pictures in the winter. So the wood. Got a nice little warm play off, off the snow, and uh, you can see some of the unique uh, angles and architecture from the, the side view. So thanks for your time, and any questions, I'm free for a couple minutes to answer those, or people are more than welcome to follow up with me in detail and discuss anything they want after the fact. Thanks so much, Marty, for that 